so we hope to have a similarly or maybe more in, uh, interesting conversation in this panel uh, so i'll start off uh, uh, with with a very quick background on the uh, powertrain situation uh, in india mostly from the passenger vehicle side and and then i'll uh, open it up for the esteemed panel members to uh, join in and i'll ask them uh, questions which uh, which i would be directing uh, to each of them uh, first few questions will be uh, you know uh, would be common for all the members then i'll be specific with my questions uh, given the organizations they represent and and the uh, uh, the background or, or the products they represent so with that uh, allow me a second i'll share my screen So yes, my name is Suraj Ghosh. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, Mukul. Uh, and I am part of uh, IHS Market, which is now a part of S&P Global. Uh, and with our acquisition into S&P Global, uh, the expertise and the domains that we work in have been divided into six main divisions. And I represent the mobility division within it. With mobility, uh, as as the agenda for today is about the powertrain of the future, uh, with the support of SNP Global Mobility's uh, data assets, uh, our clients are enabled to look into the future, uh, are assisted in make, uh, in making their investment decisions as well as uh, preparing for any regulatory changes as well as uh, competitive uh, competitive landscape that is evolving very rapidly. So th these are the different uh, value chains within the industry in which we support our customers with. And uh, right from the strategy uh, planning and, and uh, planning of their product portfolio to vehicle sales, marketing, and even uh, after the uh, sales are done towards service and aftermarket as well. So, right. Uh, when we talk about the uh, future of powertrain, these are the main uh, parameters which come into mind. Uh, the dynamics are changing very, very rapidly. Uh, the policies are increasingly become, becoming uh, inclined towards cleaner technologies, and they are becoming very, very strict for the existing legacy technologies, uh, IC or uh, otherwise. Uh, at the same time, the competitive landscape is also evolving. We have uh, we are seeing new technology players, non-legacy automotive players entering the market and uh, creating new uh, rules within the game. At the same time, the Gen Z and 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 the uh, even even the millennials, uh, the approach of owning things, be it mobility or otherwise, is changing and also their expectations from their mobility options uh, are evolving very fast. So all these factors have to be taken care of. Uh, and of course, finally, we have to see if the technology itself is ready or not, be it BVs or fuel cell electric vehicles or, or anything else. And finally, for an organization, uh, when, when they adopt okay. such a, when, when they adopt or, or realign their strategies to, to be competitive in the future scenario, they have to think of their bottom lines as well. So that's that's the uh, that's one key aspect which should, uh, cannot be ignored. So with this uh, with this the uh, the main takeaways which I want you to have is about the decision complexity uh, which all the key stakeholders in the auto industry are facing, and the decision around propulsion strategies that they have to make. And finally, some data points. Uh, I have I have two charts here. The chart on the left it shows the emergence of uh, EVs. You know, uh, it basically shows it basically shows the fuel type uh, data till 2030. We see that electricity or or electric vehicles is rising, and it will cross diesel and almost reach around 10% for passenger vehicles. I'm, I'm 
talking about and and cng as well will grow very very rapidly uh, on the other hand uh, sorry the chart on the right shows that uh, ic engines will stagnate so any future developments or investments into base ice uh, will remain flat or will almost stop most of the new investments will uh, are expected to come into uh, new technologies cleaner technologies yeah so that's that's all from uh, my end and i'll open it up for the for the uh, panel members to come in and i i'll start it up with with a question to all the members uh, i hope you'll be uh, kindly answering to this question the question is uh, we're talking about the future of powertrain so according to you what is the future when does the future start so i'll i'll start with mr samir okay sure so um thank you suraj for your introduction uh, your question is interesting when is 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 when is the future of electric uh, vehicles to come uh, you know two years back we were arguing that you know two years later every the world is going to change and everything is going to be electrified etc of course there was a there was a glide path and there was a prediction about it as we stand today at least where i see today i think the future is here and now because earlier it was a push model that the government of course with with all its uh, wisdom was applying saying that look there's fame incentive there's all kinds of nice incentive centrally and then the state government followed in the last two years today both in the passenger side as well as in the commercial side very recently we introduced our 96 volt powertrain on tata motors is ace um and the kind of uh, order uptake has been incredible absolutely outstanding for for the entire fleet segment for the uh, fleet segment on the commercial side as well so if the future is not now then when is it uh, we've just got to carve the future we've got to shape the future going forward into the next year and two but since the pull and push is happening together uh technologies will evolve there's always going to be a future of technologies which is going to be different from how you see it today but the the future of electric electrification is here and now suraj you are mute yeah sorry hmm. yeah i i I, uh, i think that's that's a very interesting answer and and i'd like to hear uh So what the other panel members think about the timing? Uh, do they agree with what Mr. Samir said, Mr. Uday? Yes, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more with. Uh, first of all, great to be on the panel, um, and I would say I couldn't agree more with uh, what Samir Sahn has said. Um, the future, you know, people say the future is electric. I say the present is electric, guys. The demand pool, um, the you know, the the. amount of support the electrification and i'm not just talking about you know you know evs whether it is evs it's green energy or blue energy what is most important to understand is the need of the hour is for green energy and uh, you know sustainability so i totally am in agreement um you know that we have a huge amount of um you know uh, the the demand at this moment and i think that this is just the tip of the iceberg we have got a huge amount of um you know work to do as an entire industry and what i really would like is responsible oems this is something that is very important to me um i think just making one power you know um, you know omega has been around for 52 years uh, you know we made parts for all the large players obviously we become our oem ourselves now but i would say you know make sure safety quality and testing making one powertrain or five powertrains doesn't mean that you've got you know one life lost is too many for them right so i would recommend all of the young men and women in this industry startups are beautiful i love it right but give it enough testing give enough volume give enough scale 
That's something that we all are responsible for. Just putting products in the name of raising money. In my view, and I was a hedge fund manager for 30 years in US and Europe, and I understand the current world of startups pretty well myself. I've invested, I've built many startups myself, is that we need to focus on that. But I couldn't agree with Samir. Um, you know, again, uh, there are certain views I have on the future of powertrains. I'll let the other people speak and we can add to it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll, I'll have the same question uh, for all the panel members. So I'll ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Harjab uh, to come in with his views on this. Uh, uh, just, just a short uh, interjection from my side. Uh, I think most of the members would agree that uh, the future is now, but uh, we'd like to understand if, when is the time or when is the period from when uh, electrification will not remain niche or minority, rather they'll become the mainstream. So if you could uh, put your views on that. Thanks, Gosh. Basically, like uh, in the past four decades, we have gone through the, a lot of changes in the automotive industry from carburetor to MPFI to CRDI, then GDI, then a lot of uh, emission technology has been. But still, the, we were uh, struggling with the emissions and uh, these uh, all the regulations are guiding the industry to move forward to that. Now the time has come that we need to further work on that reduce the emissions. So electrification is one of the options which can be seen. But we have to see in a complete uh, holistic way that infrastructure has to be also prepared according to that. So because like uh, in the, like uh, Ajay said in the one of the session from Paruti that in NCR area we are struggling for, for the electricity. So infrastructure will be very important. Yeah, definitely. All the past challenges, uh, whatever challenges were there, was met by the industry. And the, the challenge of uh, electricity, what are the validation which is required, will be met by them. And the proven uh, technology will come to the market. But as a, I have said, that complete holistic approach has to be seen. And the government has to also work in line with the industry who are uh, working on the electrifications. That is my view. Yeah, um, I, I think quite rational. Thank you so much. And and uh, Mr. Amitabh sir, uh, Dr. Amitabh sir, sorry. Your views, please. Thank Hi. you. Um, thanks, Suraj. First, of course, a quick clarification. Um, Amitabh, unfortunately, was not able to join. Uh, my name is Shalens Gupta. I'm co-founder along with Amitabh of Altigreen. Um, so you guys will pardon me for butting in uh, where Amitabh was supposed to be, but... Uh, uh, I'll try and I'll try and you know he's he's of course uh, far more knowledgeable about the industry than I am, but uh, I'll try and do my bit. Uh, you know the question, Suraj, is is valid, um, and I'm glad you you put in that uh, clarificatory point in the middle as to when does it become mainstream. And I think while we all, and especially amongst the startups, while we would all like to believe that the future is now, I think the the answer is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, we have to we have to look at the granularity of it. Uh, if we look at the automotive industry as a whole, uh, one could say that you know electric vehicles will become mainstream ten years from now, fifteen years from now. Uh, even if we look at startup time and not uh, incumbent OEM time, but uh, it's it's worth uh, 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 slicing and dicing the industry a little bit to so say which kind of platform are we talking about. And the moment you do that, you get different answers. So, for example, if you talk about last mile transport, smaller format vehicles, whether it's two wheelers, whether it's three wheelers, whether it is uh, small four wheelers, like Samir spoke about uh, the Tata Ace, uh, response to the Tata Ace, the small commercial four wheelers. I think it's fairly clear that techno commercially, these platform vehicles have become, uh, uh, have become tilted in favor of electric right now. Uh, and I say techno commercially, but not yet in the market. That may still take a year, two years, three years to come. I uh, I think we are reasonably confident that it won't take ten years for this format of vehicles. Also, uh, uh, you know, electric buses, large format vehicles, particularly buses and intracity buses, are going to become mainstream electric within the next two to five years. And by mainstream electric, I don't mean you know more than fifty percent, but certainly a large enough percentage to give the shivers to the incumbents if they do not choose to go uh, electric. Um, so 
the moment we we dice it we get those answers passenger vehicles perhaps may be the last to become uh, uh, mainstream electric in india uh, it's changing uh, of course uh, at a different rate in other parts of the world, world but for for the moment let's just stick to india so uh, uh, i think the, the the one question that nobody answered and perhaps we all agree with that the future is electric it's not it's not anything else right uh, at least for the next 40 50 years until we see uh, a scotty coming into the picture um uh, with with beam me up uh, but for now it's electric whether it is fuel cell whether it is batteries whether it's any other uh, pantone based uh, thing it's all electric but different times for different platforms that's our feel right right thank you so much uh, mr shailendra so uh, i think uh, most of us agree that the future is electric of course uh, there might be differences when that future starts and uh, and in that future uh, elect- electrified vehicles will it will it be still minority or uh, uh, or will have will they have become uh, mainstream by then so yeah so we'll wait for the future and then see uh, what happens then i'll i'll move to the next question uh, so far electrification in india uh, the the trigger which happened for uh, electrifying uh, be it any category two wheelers three wheelers or the passenger vehicles uh, was enabled by the support from government uh, be it the special gst bracket or uh, the fame benefit or the recently announced uh, the pli scheme so uh, now let's imagine a future uh, where the projections or, or the volumes or or the uptake of evs in in two wheelers three wheelers passenger vehicles have uh, gone up and the government starts receding the support starts taking back the support uh, increases the gst or maybe takes away the fame benefit so what happens in that situation so i'll start with uh, i'll i'll start with mr narang first uh, so in in a in a uh, in a no no support scenario uh do you think the industry the the ev industry of india will be able to sustain and keep growing look i think um you know we at osm have continuously believe that um you know um you know we we can't the 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 crutch of fame it's good it helps but i think we have to be all profitable uh with our businesses because you know um uh, i think and especially uh you know a huge amount of companies are based on raising funding you know for what i see uh in the startup world if you don't make any money you know your 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 investors are going to run you might be able to get that first date or the second date but by the third date they're going to be very ruthless um so my point is uh, you know and and me having 30 years experience in that field i understand how um you know investors are but answering your question we are of the belief at osm um and i think that we have to make sure that yes the fame subsidy is good but i think you have to be able to produce vehicles profitably over a very um near term um without that government support um i think localization um you know of and and we have taken that path localization of power trains motors um you know we are uh, you know we're going to make our own battery packs uh making sure um you know having that supply chain control uh will because at the moment i don't know everyone is um struggling with supply chain i don't think there is anybody in this room right now or in the group that is not supply right. chain and and what's what i find strange is you know some of the big players there was a a two wheeler player who said last year, last month that uh you know a person who i respect very highly that said that we don't have any production because we couldn't get any chips we couldn't produce any and i think that's staggering to hear i mean supply chain control is extremely important and if um you know the only country i think which is really close right now is china right um you know i i have very long history with asean um and i think i would say dependence on china is very very stupid right i mean we have to make sure that we have that but i think controlling the price will be making sure that you control supply chain 
battery prices, powertrain prices, everything is going up. Okay, we've just had some steel price down move on this announcement, but generally through, and I'm an old commodities trader, uh, so I know commodities pretty well, is that the entire commodity business has jumped up. So I think that long-term businesses, the, 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 the seconders of tomorrow are gonna be the ones that can be able to stand by itself. I think in the next couple of years, it's okay that the government helps, but I think, that long-term sustainability on this or a business model on fame subsidy support is very detrimental for anybody's business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think you partly answered some of my upcoming questions. So I, I, I'm going to ask you to elaborate more on them later at a later stage. So thank you anyways. Next, the same question to, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm throwing the same question to Mr. Shalinder. And, and would like to know, you know, what, what are your views? Without the FAME support, without the other government support, uh, how do you see the future? Like, you know, um, I think the future is not based on specific policies. Government is always the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Uh, you can't go against the government, you can't fight the government, uh, but it's clear that the government is supporting the future and will continue to do so, uh, so long as it is required. However, the long-term trends are, are, you know, this is what you call secular trends. Um, an electric powertrain is four to five times more efficient than a combustion engine powertrain. You know, so it, it extracts four to five times more usable energy uh, from every hundred joules of energy that's supplied to it. Undeniable, uh, can't fight with it. Um, electricity generation is going to keep getting cheaper as, uh, as the years go by. So the trends are clearly in favor of electric. The purpose of government support is to enable uh, uh, the industry to uh, get on its feet quickly, but it has to stand on its own feet. It can't be, can't be uh, dependent on crutches for too long. Uh, the ice industry, unfortunately, has been dependent on government crutches for a very, very long time. Uh, when the government chooses to take away the support, uh, and you rightly mentioned fame subsidy, you mentioned uh, GST, which, you know, all of us uh, uh, ignore or forget. You know, it's a very substantial uh, benefit that the uh, EV industry has got. But it's necessary to enable the EV industry to, to get up on its feet. Because at the end of the day, let's, let's, let's not forget, I mean, there are a million people dying early in India every year because of pollution from road transport. I think uh, uh, your own technologies and therefore you control the supply chain, which means you are, you know, at Altergreen, for example, we buy steel and copper. We don't buy motors and controllers, right? The moment you reach that level, then you have a much greater uh, control over the supply chain and the costs. My short answer is uh, EV industry will stand on its own feet whenever the government chooses to start withdrawing the support. We hope they will do it gradually and not uh, suddenly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Mr. Samir, uh, your views? Uh, how, how do you think? Rightly expressed, but I'll say it in a different way that every fleet operator today or fleet owner running lots of vehicles, either on the passenger side or on the commercial side, has got two business models. And they're not foolish anymore. They know that one day that subsidy or whatever will go away. Uh, so we have seen multiple business models wherein they have expressed that if the battery life can be extended by X, Y, or Z, and the other subsystems' lives can be extended, then actually the business case can stand on its own feet even today without the fame subsidy. Uh, or some other, I mean, GST or no GST, that's another good question, but, um, or lesser GST. But I think as far as fame is concerned, people have built business models which are independent of fame subsidy, knowing fully well that tomorrow, if it comes down or goes away, they still have to uh, survive and, and grow. So uh, there's a strong foundation for EVs to, because as rightly put by Shailendra, that it sucks less energy 
uh, per joule given it it uses more of the energy and wastes less so it's it's obviously got a great case but uh, i think today more than ever before uh, at least the fleet operators are not foolish they are building their business case outside of the fame subsidy as well fame subsidy and uh, state support like you call it is great to have and it definitely accelerates today there are four or five companies who will stand up and say the profit margins will come down significantly if that just vanishes tomorrow but i'm pretty sure that there's going to be a phase wise approach more importantly technologies are improving so battery life is increasing whether it is made in india or not made in india motors is improving they're looking at obviously more sustainable controllers uh, cheaper controllers uh, rightly put by uh, uday ji that it's not just going to be a game of importing you got to build your own electronic chips and, and you got to understand the tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 business of of electronics um, and commodities to be able to survive that's all happening that's forced right now because suddenly the prices have shot up suddenly the availability has gone down and big players have gone uh, pretty much out of at least monthly business if not uh, annual business so i think all that's happening but people are building business cases today that do not uh, need fame subsidy and i think it's not going to go away but it's it's smart to be able to understand what is needed to build a stronger business case and it's happening right right thank you um i'm i'm getting a very coherent uh, sense of uh, views here so i'll ask mr uh, harjab if 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 he mostly agrees with the views here or uh, does he have a a different perspective on it uh, or does yeah. he think that the ic or the legacy technology will will compete in some way maybe yeah samir goes uh, uh, i agree with uday shalender and uh, samir ji views on that but uh, i would like to add some of the ideas like uh, india market is quite uh, price sensitive the buyer the, the cost is very important for them but there are some things which i am hearing that that is one of the major contributor for the cost so maybe for the buses or some uh, big vehicles the battery cost is uh, quite high so some leasing schemes are there which may come very soon so if the leasing scheme is there the cost of the basically complete setup of electrification will go down so this will also add up and there is an excitement in the market because the overall the running cost is less the theft of the diesel gasoline these are not these things are not there infrastructure will definitely improve government's policies are there which are in line with the uh, industry and the regulation which are there plus uh, i think the infrastructure for the like uh, validations are also quite good if proper testing and validation will be there i think this will be a quite success in near future thank you thank you for your views uh, so yeah uh, i think uh, the sense which which comes out from this question is that uh without the support without the government support the industry is most likely to is, is the industry is very confident that it will stand up and it will continue growing so that's very heartening to hear actually uh, from the leaders here to express that kind of views so uh, but also that there were some points about control on supply chain and and it bringing cost so my my next question is uh, towards that so the question is uh, 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 you know with with the global uh, with the global uh, ev supply chain being dominated by china and and there is a race for acquiring uh, certain certain elements of the value chain uh, within within the within the uh, ev industry uh, how uh, you know what is the position of indian oems or or indian technology companies or indian uh, indian suppliers globally you know when when you compete with the global peers so where do we stand today or or where do you think we'll stand in 5 years in in the next 10 years uh, i'll i'll start off with uh, i'll start off with uh, mr mr samir again um look i think you're going to deconstruct the problem into maybe two or three things one is where are we today i think rightly stated earlier that Uh, we are not even taken seriously by the primary uh, chip 
or, or PCB manufacturers or chip suppliers rather, let's say from Taiwan or wherever, directly not so. It's through distributors. Now, um, as the scale increases, more and more attention will come to those OEMs, Indian OEMs or, or OEMs that are relevant in India or for India to uh, talk directly to some of these chip manufacturers, whether they are in China, Taiwan, wherever, whichever part of the world. Um, I'm For a minute, I'm not just saying China versus the rest of the world, okay? It's not just a war against China here. It's, a, it's about becoming self-sufficient. Um, so there's that issue that today we're not taken seriously because the market is not scaled. Now, it's looking to scale. There are certain parts of the market, like Shelly the rightly put it, you have to decompose it into three, four different segments and then look at it. So there is scale and scale means um, attention. Attention means uh, better deals. Better deals means even your purchasing power increases and and you have to have control over your tier two, tier three, not only just your tier one. So that's going to happen. The second thing is technology itself. I think India um, sometimes is shy to say that, look, they can really innovate. I mean, IT guys across the globe have proven at least in the digital space, that they can uh, dominate uh, innovation. And um, uh, and similarly, I find that the technologies today that are evolving on the battery side, as well as on the motor side, will see very strong players um, coming from India, for India, and for the rest of the world. So for India to the rest of the world, um, I can already see a lot of action happening. Obviously, one has to see the outcome of that. But um, it's not necessarily all going to innovate from China. There's going to be lots of innovation that's going to still, it's still called electric cars, but it's going to have different types of battery technology that, of course, if the government supports and people um, support it, because ultimately the acceptance has to come from people. And it's well-tested, like Uday mentioned. It's got to be well-tested and validated. You'll see them coming into the space. So, So one is, scale already so people get attention they get um, you know two they make use of these pli schemes and actually build batteries and other things in india three is innovation innovation is a key factor to see more and more alternatives coming where indian indians become serious in the next five to ten years and i didn't say two to three years because i know that's tough you start innovating yesterday you will still take five years before you can make a product so I think these these are the factors where India will become more and more self-sufficient. It's not going to happen overnight for sure. So the dependence on whether it's China, Taiwan, Korea, or whichever other country that's already there in, in the supply space um, is going to be there. True. Uh, I think I mostly agree with that. And I, I understand the situation right now for the Indian OEMs and the position they are in. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll come to Mr. Naran, you know, uh, that question and, and a slight addition to that. Uh, uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, technical capabilities and, and uh, commercial scalability, um, I, have, I have noted that you, you talk about new startups and their hurry to uh, bring in products to the market and, and maybe, maybe little compromises on quality or, or, or some other safety issues. Uh, and, and it could lead to some some very bad experiences and, and even fatal uh, accidents. So uh, uh, apart from apart from our position in in the global, uh, you know, the bargaining balance of of acquiring the key uh, elements of the supply chain, what what do you think is 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 that uh, what are the technical capabilities uh, that Indian OEMs can build so that they can be they can be uh, at par with the global peers and also bring scale uh, into the operations. Look, I think, uh, you know, I, I welcome startups. It's a great, it's a great for the ecosystem. But, you know, companies like Dana and Curtis have been doing it for a hundred years. That doesn't mean that some new guy comes in and says, um, you know, I'm building a powertrain or a motor. Um, you know, they build five or 10. Um, I think it takes time. And I'm with Synergy, you know, building five, 10 and just saying I can do 10,000 or a million takes time. And I, this is my view, maybe just maybe being 50 years in the game, uh, you know, uh, sort of changes that. And I, and I agree with Samirji completely on this. Um, but I think having new players is welcome. I think they are disruptors. We are disruptors in the truck business right now. 
Um, uh, you know, I think uh, from what I see, I haven't, I haven't been, work, I haven't uh, met uh, the Alti Green guys before, but from what I hear, they're doing some great work on powertrains. I respect that we are building our powertrains ourselves. Uh, we are bringing a completely Korean technology um, on powertrains. So I think, but my key key part is make sure give it some time. This is very critical. This is making this stuff is not just child's play. Right, this is very, very, it's very precision work. Um, go to a Dana factory or go to what Curtis is doing. I mean, please, it takes a lot of money and a lot of effort to do this. Um, you know, in terms of powertrains of the future, I wrote a few points for myself. You know, high level of efficiency of motors, new age motors like axle flux motors would be used in EVs. This is something that we should work on. You know, um, motors that become small sizes. Um, you know, we're working with EVR, um, you know, an Israeli company on this, uh, where we're going to manufacture them in India, high speed and high efficiency in terms of power to weight ratio, um, energy consumption and usage of, um, you know, rare earths, low cost and high efficient magnet free EV motors, uh, sustainable for all EV classes should be developed. You know, these magnet free motors you know, are very, very critical. Uh, you know, I know Mahale and uh, Continental have, you know, they have efficiency of over 95%. Um, they need to be standard for energy consumption similar to emission norms. I think this is something that needs to be worked on. Um, obviously, uh, battery power and energy density will increase exponentially uh, in the next five years. Uh, and, you know, charging times will reduce. So the key part of all this is to reduce charging times. Uh, you know, I know I'm, you know, I know, uh, you know, Alti Green's working on it. We are already working with Log9, um, you know, on fast charging. Um, you know, there are going to be multiple other areas on the trucks. We are working uh, on fast charging for uh, 15 to 20 minutes on 100 to 125 kilometers. Um, you know, obviously the price of batteries, um, you know, at the moment are very high. We're all dealing with it. But I think in the very near future, price are going to be below $100 per kilowatt hour. Uh, that is also what disruption does to an industry. And, you know, we, we have to see examples of the computers, phones, TVs. There is a lot of change coming. And I think, um, you know, Indian startups, uh, players that are obviously existing, I have a huge amount of respect for Dana and, and, and other players here. Um, I think startups are going to do it. We're going to be part of it. I see Alti Green doing it. I see many more new players doing it. Um, so I think... Um, we've got a great chance. Um, you know, EV is a very much of a game changer. Just being, I, I think in the next five or seven years, um, the OEMs that are in the, in the IC engine doesn't mean they're the only ones going to be in the top five or six. So I think there's a whole Mr. lot of- Mr. May I, may I interject? I'm sorry for that. But uh, could you be specific on the vehicle categories you think will, will you know, bring the scale or will, will enable the uh, scaling up of operations you talk about or-, or... I don't help the companies, yeah. We are extremely, extremely bullish on, obviously I think uh, the three-wheeler industry is fantastically, it's just growing amazingly, not just, and see for us, OSM is building global products. We are the, yeah, I think the only EV company that clearly is exporting vehicles now uh, to Asia and to Africa. Um, we, are set, we are testing our vehicles right now as you speak in the GCC. Um, so the three-wheeler market, and this is, the three-wheeler market is very, very punchy and very strong. The two-wheeler market, mate, every day there's a new player who says they're gonna sell a million vehicles. So I don't know, I'm not gonna answer that question. Um, I was on a panel uh, maybe um, uh, two weeks ago, there was a young kid at 20 years old um, who started building first vehicle and he said, I'm gonna be selling a million vehicles in two years. I said, great, mate, you're in a different ball game. I think I need to get that Kool-Aid that you're drinking uh, very fast. So the two-wheeler market is very, very, I mean, every day there's a new player and everybody wants to sell a million vehicles. So that answers that question. Um, on the four-wheelers, which we are getting into quite heavily, um, I think, um, you know, by 2030 to 2035, you'll see 30 to 40%. That's an area where pollution is the highest. Uh, logistics, you know, this country is 30 and a half percent of GDP. We want to crack that market. So I think the overall industry grows. We are working on something on tractors, um, you know, also. 
So I think the three wheelers and the two wheelers are low hanging fruit that will continually grow. I think the two wheeler you know, market is a very tricky market in my view. Uh, in, and, in, and the competition is extremely intense for new players. Uh, the big boys and the big girls are there ready. Uh, the four wheelers, again, is something that we definitely want to push. Uh, we, we just launched a three and a half ton you know, truck and one and a half are coming. Um, so I think the, the, the game will be, to answer your question, three, and a, three wheelers, two wheelers, four wheelers, and then the rest. Agriculture sector, I believe, has a very, very bright future in electrification. We are working towards it and we want to push that. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that was quite detailed. So quickly, uh, quickly, uh, I'll, I'll move to Mr. Gupta and, and have his views briefly. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to Mr. Harjab uh, with a slight twist on the question. So, uh, so uh, you know, um, um, both Samir and Uday have put in some good points. Uh, I, slightly different perspective that I want to put, you know, you, you start this question on supply chain and our dependence or the world's dependence on China as the EV supply chain uh, hub of the world. I think to a very large extent, uh, the rest of the world and India in particular is responsible for the state of affairs. And there's no reason for us to be dependent on China. Um, other really, other than cells, you know, lithium ion cells, there is nothing that China makes that we are not, and by we, I, I don't just mean all to be, I mean as a country, uh, that we are not already making. Right? Whether it is motors, whether it's controllers, DC to DC converters, uh, whatever else it be, we really don't need to be dependent on China. And the cells also, of course, now with the PLI scheme and with uh, you know uh, the cells need the big boys, uh, you know Exide and Reliance and others, uh, they are going to be setting up their cell factories. I think on cells itself, within five years, we should not be dependent on China anymore. But on the rest of the things, you know, it's a question of do we own the technology or are we dependent on somebody else? And not just China. I mean, whether it is Taiwan, whether it's Korea, whether it is Germany, whether it's anywhere else, are we buying controllers or are we buying chips? And of course, you know, in the last three, four weeks, I don't know whether it is going to fructify into reality or not, but, you know, people are announcing setting up uh, chip plants in the country. So... If that happens, then there is no longer any dependence on China. But chips, in any case, we are not dependent on China. That's the, the plenty of other countries which are making chips. Cells also, two years from now, Excite will have its plant up. Uh, Reliance will have its plant up and running. We'll start getting cells from within India. The rest of the things, you know, steel, in, uh, India makes steel. India makes copper. What is it that we don't make? We don't need to be dependent on any other country. Really. But if we are dependent on them for technology, if you are saying, oh, we are going to use, you know, Taiwanese technology or Korean technology or, you know, Chinese technology or anything else, then yes, we will continue to be dependent. If we are not designing our own components. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, actually. I mean, I'm, I'm really intrigued about the five years timeline uh, that you've mentioned that after, after that, we might be you know, we, we might not be dependent on China for battery cells anymore. So I look forward to that future. I hope that happens. Um, yeah, so, so the question to Mr. Haljab, you know, you, you, uh, you represent more of a consulting side of, of, of things and you, have a, you might have a different perspective. So the question to you is slightly different. Uh, do, you, do you see now uh, legacy automakers who have been slow to the EV game or the electrification game coming to you and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe handhold them or, or show them the path or, or uh, just give them a peek about the future and, and you know, of that sort, do, do they depend on you for that? Yeah, certainly, Suraj, these gaps is there, the gaps are there in the technology and the learnings and the skill which the basic, the, the person who want to build the electric vehicles area. Then the gap is there, the opportunity is also there. Similar way, like uh, we were discussing on the components availability from the China or some outsourcing or which are, we are getting from other countries. So if the gaps are there, a lot of uh, startups are coming up to fill that gap. So technology is building up very fast. So similar way, the consulting requirements are already also there, which need to be fulfilled. Yeah. 
and uh, L5 is one of the area in uh, like the division of the buses L5 and two wheeler. I think passenger car may take some time because the Indian homes are quite uh, self-dependent on that. Area. But the small players who are there and the new entrants which are there, like uh, earlier there was a lot of uh, OEMs who were manufacturing the vehicle in India. But now because this vehicle, electric vehicle can be produced by the many people. So new OEMs are coming up. So the new OEMs, they need uh, hand-holding for the like uh, technology. Right. So the entry barriers have been lowered uh, by by because of electrification, maybe, and that is leading new new players uh, entering the market. That's yeah, that's that's a phenomenon uh, that is actually happening. So yeah, thank you, thank you for your view. Uh, so my next question, uh, uh, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, I'll start off with Mr. Gupta first. Uh, in this case, uh, the question is around. Uh, you know, we talked about supply chain. We talked about dependence on China. Uh, this is more more from the uh, from the battery and 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 cell aspect uh, the current supply chain uh, that we have of for regular components not ev specific components uh, how do you think they will orient or or they will evolve with electrification so suraj uh, <clears throat> when you talk about uh, non ev regular components uh, I presume you're talking about proprietary components, uh, you know, which are also used in ICE vehicles. Is that is that your question? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I think there we have a very large and very well-established ecosystem already. Uh, you know, if you look at all the other components, whether it is, you know, steel or steel fabrication or steel structures, whether it's shock absorbers, windshields, braking systems, and so on. We have a very large uh, ecosystem uh, developed for manufacturing these components. Unfortunately, uh, I believe that to some extent, I don't know to, you know, uh, whether I would say to a very large extent or to some extent at least, even for those components, those technologies are not being developed in India by Indian companies. So to some extent, we continue to remain dependent for even those components on uh, companies which are not Indian, not Indian owned. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm a very staunch nationalist, uh, uh, large hearted patriot, but at the end of the day, business is business, right? Uh, I'm not a protectionist by any means. Uh, and therefore, if we are getting great technology from outside the country and it helps the country, why not? Or it helps the business, why not? So long as we are not uh, destroying national resources or the world resources. Um, but uh, perhaps I'm digressing a little bit. I think I, it's, it's important to keep in mind that developing technology is not, uh, is not a short-term game. I think Uday mentioned this uh, you have to put in time and effort and you have to put in the engineering effort into it. You have to put in engineering skill into it. And therefore, you have to be willing to put in that, you know, to stay those many years without revenue and not look for short-term revenue. Uh, and therefore, here are the two flip sides, you know, the, the two alternative paths. Broadly, of course, there are many paths, right, to God. But there are, there are, there are the two alternative or extreme paths. One is where you say, I'm going to develop everything myself, motors, controllers, DC-DC converters, battery packs, so on and so forth. And honestly, that's a path that Altigreen has taken. And, you know, 10 years of R&D on that. Or you take a path uh, uh, which says that I will buy out motors, controllers, you know, the best one available, and I'll just buy it out and launch a product quickly into the market. And both are equally valid so long as one takes care of the basics, which is to ensure uh, safety, reliability, value for the customer, uh, confidence to the customer, and so uh, We like to believe that uh, the path that we have chosen uh, gives us much greater control over our destiny, but then other paths are equally valid. Right. So, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your views. Um, uh, Mr. Naran, so I wanted to know your views on, on, uh, on you know, 
similar similar question but a slight twist on that as well uh in terms of the local supplier community uh with this electrification revolution uh, picking up uh do you think there is pressure on on the on the supplier community who produce power train components and and how do you think they will evolve or or adjust or adapt to this new situation It's, look i i you know i i agree with uh, you know um you know with shalendra um you know i think um there are different in england we say different horses for different courses i don't think there is one horse there's one race track here uh specifically in india um you know different products you know i'll give you an example we give 140 cft box on the on the two wheeler somebody wants three wheeler somebody wants 160 170 180 i don't know i think one day somebody want a house on three wheeler i i think this is craziness but this is india um and i think you know supply chains um you know i think the winners will be and and, and uh, i'm a very uh, you know black and white i'm not as um you know uh, uh you know you know politically uh, politically inclined as maybe shalender ji would be is that i think the only way to win right now is to have control of supply chains because supply chains are going to be tricky um i i you know we mentioned in china because everybody buys so much from china korea and japan is so expensive very little stuff you know very small amount of i mean how much do we actually really import from uh you know from those two countries uh, and taiwan is a possibility but what i'm saying is that um you know the the winners will be people that have control at least for the next 4 to 5 years uh on supply chains um and i think that supply, but there will be development of new supply so you can also do supply chains two ways you can do joint ventures with companies that have you can spend and i can i'll take a different spend you can spend 10 years doing r&d or you can do you can bring a joint venture into this country that has done r&d for 15 years built products successfully globally you bring them in india you make in india you localize the product because india needs localization so once again it's a very very um you know there will be opportunities for suppliers to develop here we are seeing now um you know when we started this journey also several years ago um, you know we are an OEM you know we are not a parts manufacturer we supply to all the big players uh, nationally and internationally um a lot of players ignored electric vehicles now nobody can and i think the world is underestimating india demand i think there's another opportunity where india can become there's a 500 billion dollar export and parts production of evs and india has the capabilities has the engineers has the technology we have 15 factories across this country that are doing that we are changing our way my friends at many precision um, you know like are, are doing that gautam many is doing this right now there are many players that are changing you know change with the change with the time the time will change you so i think there is a mix and match of a lot of stuff there's a lot of opportunities but then there's also some people that are not changing with the time and i'm unfortunately they're going to be gone that's how capitalism you know spending 35 years in us and europe um uh, that's how capitalism works um you know and everyone today uh has you know it started from trump son who said made in america it's a made in rwanda made in india everybody wants to make in whatever country they want this is sort of an official line for political people um so i think that for us um you know suppliers can have alliances local suppliers will have chance we have chosen the same way i think we have a similar path uh we believe that um you know the control of supply chain is critical for success over the next 5 years at least in the ev sector thank you yeah i i think i think great answer and and very informative um thank you so much uh, uh um before i uh, you know before uh, i i don't want to uh, shoot this question to mr sohi here um rather i i point my questions more company specifics from here on keeping the time in mind so my my next question would be to mr samir uh, uh, i i would like to understand you know like uh, the, the organization he represents here today uh, electra ev uh, we we most of us are aware of its uh, collaboration with uh, tata motors uh, so we want to understand if if there are similar collaborations expected uh, from electra ev with other oems maybe in the two wheeler space three wheeler space or any other uh, vehicle category it's it is indeed a new uh, concept because um, 
uh, if you think about it, a lot of the OEMs may want to develop the entire power grid themselves, but a few of them, uh, as has been pointed out before, will want to finally bring products for different applications and they will have a requirement for independent powertrain players, quite akin to uh, you know, the ICE market. And so what we are seeing is that whilst we are deepening our relationship with the Tata Motors and the first customer that uh, has worked with us, we are getting multiple inquiries. And in fact, we started working with off-highway tractor companies, uh, three-wheelers who also want to build uh, commercial vehicles that are uh, going to go to the fleet market and less so two wheelers because obviously you know you grow up in a certain way you're 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 mastered the four wheel 72 volt 96 volt systems and so you're kind of getting more inquiries around that um, obviously the working relationships have to be established it's uh, it's something that you've got to work on because you it's a very intimate relationship you 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 build and yet it has to be arm's length because it's it's a relationship that uh, you know, you are supplying and then you've got to figure out uh, whether you do co-sourcing or you, you know, you source separately because we're just not a design and develop company. So to answer your question in, in sum and substance, besides deepening our relationship with Data Motors on the 72 and 96 volt systems, we're getting multiple inquiries from off-highway, specifically tractor companies and three-wheelers companies who have um, large payload uh, needs. And, uh, and and want to electrify. So mostly OEMs um, that are coming and we are working with them. Right, right. Thank you so much. And and uh, uh, with, with that, uh, you know, the next question is to Mr. Uh, Mr. Gupta. Uh, with uh, with three wheelers already taking up, I think uh, more than decent share uh, in in the three wheeler category. And, and you being uh, majorly a player in the three-wheeler segment right now, I know you might have plans for entering the other vehicle categories. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, this, this, this adoption uh, will completely become mainstream in the next few years? Uh, that's part one. And, and what are the major challenges? You know, because the, the use cases for three-wheelers, uh, I think, are already there. So what are the major challenges you think you, you have uh, faced, you know, from fleet owners and, and the end users, the operators, uh, with regards to the EVs, you know, and, and using them? We are very clear. Three wheelers are going to become mainstream. Electric three wheelers are going to become mainstream in the three wheeler category very, very soon. Um, like trying to predict the stock market, it would be foolish for me to try and say, you know, which year will they become 50% and which year will they become 90%. But let's just say very soon. And the reason I am so supremely confident about this is because, you know, today on a total cost of ownership basis, uh, even with the recently reduced diesel prices, uh, at least the Alter Green three wheelers have a 60% TCO benefit over diesel three wheelers. A 35% TCO benefit over CNG3. Right? There is no rational reason for anybody to buy an ICE three wheeler even today. The reason they will continue to buy three wheelers is two, twofold or threefold. One is uh, um, simply lack of availability. Right? There are not enough electric three wheelers being made in the country today. That will change over the next couple of years. Uh, we ourselves are setting up a large plant. Uh, we'll continue to innovate and improve the value proposition for customers. The second reason that people are uh, still buying ICE vehicles is because of the confidence on, on electric three-wheelers is not yet there. You know, in a couple of years, they would have used vehicles two years, three years. They would have seen that they perform, that they're reliable. Uh, God willing, uh, uh, I hope things continue the way they are in three-wheelers where we don't see these you know, battery fires and uh, folks breaking and so on and so forth, right? So, because that 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 gives a setback to the entire industry, not just to the individual company. You know, two-wheeler uh, battery fires have given a setback, not just to the particular two-wheeler company, but to the two-wheeler EV industry, even to the three-wheeler EV industry. People become more cautious. 
so it's really those two parameters third parameter is also linked to confidence which is the financier's confidence vehicle finance so these are really the three reasons why even let's say in june july august of 22 ice vehicles will continue to be sold how long that will continue one doesn't know but i'm hopeful that within 3 4 5 years they will be very very mainstream well above 50% of the three wheeler uh, sold in the country the exact numbers you know hard to say i'm sorry you had a second part to that question which i kind of got sidetracked uh, uh, the major problems uh, you know you, uh, yes. the users are facing yeah so i think i've already mentioned that you know the the vehicle financing is one of them and a general level of confidence so those customers who have bought vehicles have developed the confidence in as little as 2 months 3 months of running i mean even 5 minutes they sit in the vehicle and they sat in other evs and they know the difference and they they have the confidence but obviously you know 6 months of use brings that confidence so that is one challenge and the other is vehicle financing for evs i think that's also getting sorted out over the next uh, you know last 8 months and the next 10 months this will get sorted out i think those challenges will be gone right right thank you thank you so uh so, yeah. ju- sorry just 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 before sure. i conclude here you know i think uh, i may not get an opportunity later you know one of your early questions was about subsidies and just now i mentioned about a 60% tco advantage i you know i don't want to send the wrong message to the government that we are we are good for the fame subsidy and gst to be removed right yes. it will still take a few years for us to pick up scale as you know uh, mr sohi said and others said we need to be given the opportunity to to achieve that scale and then then we will ourselves come to the government and say nahi chahiye <laughs> maybe uh, i'm not sure if all the oems will agree with that they'll they'll, they'll voluntarily say nahi chahiye that's we, that's we, very we, unlikely we. to happen nonetheless uh, <laughs> thank you thank you so much and uh, actually we we are uh, you know very close to uh, the 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 closing times of this session but we will ha- will try to keep as much time for q and a from the audience we already have uh, so many questions coming in so i want to keep few uh, some minutes for that as well and and from all the members uh, but at the same time i'm informed that mr samir will be uh, leaving the conference in another 5 minutes or so uh, I also got to leave. I I also get on I got to get to a call to Africa so um, I got to leave in about 2 3 minutes myself. So just to be clear. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Narayan before you leave you know I I've, I've got a question for you uh, maybe maybe you can also add your concluding remarks with that. Uh, uh, uh with with Omega CT you know with your intentions to enter all the other vehicle segment categories apart from the three wheeler segment that you do right now. Uh how would you how would you tackle the you know the supply chain issue only from the battery cells or battery pack point of view so how how are we going to address that well look i think uh, you know we um, you know we're the only company right now that has got uh, fast charging fixed um, you know and swap um, and swap so i think but we are working right now um hopefully in the next month or two you will hear on a major announcement where um cells as 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 everybody knows most people i would say are bringing cells from china i think everybody is mostly uh we are going to bring cells from the united cells a uh, united states uh from and and at a price that is going to be very significant um you know somebody uh, i think uh, you know india is the most i mean i've spent 30 years between us and india is the most price sensitive market um you know uh, every day uh, you know pricing is under pressure so i think uh, on a battery supply chain we want to um, i'm not buying copper uh, and i used to be a ve- on the lme london metal exchange a very significant copper trader so uh, i'll look up your demand next time uh, you know because you're buying copper and aluminum and all of that um, at alti green uh, shalender um, you know i ran one of the larger commodity funds in the world in my younger days um but what i would say is that on the battery side we believe having our own battery packs um you know building our you know so we will be bringing cells from the united states at a price which is very significantly attractive and making our own battery packs um the cells will come from the united states we will ha- we will make a major announcement um we have tied up with a gigafactory somebody who's uh, going to work with us very closely uh he's one of the larger players in the united states 
Um, so I want to I want to get my dependence off that. Um, I think uh, battery prices should go below hundred, uh, as I said, hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. Uh, I think they're too too high at the moment. Um, but I mean, swap is there, and they're going to be. Um, I think uh, you know, Alti Green's working with somebody on fast charging. We are working on fast charging. There's multiple options that are coming um, in this space. Uh, I think uh, we've got to change. There'll be continuous development in this space. Technology plays a major role. Um, so I think this is something that is extremely important. And I think, uh, uh, look, uh, I, think, I think the future is very good. I, I'm not saying this because um, I am part of the system. For me, um, I, am, I want to make a difference in the uh, ecosystem. Uh, you know, I want to bring green energy and sustainability for our, your kids and your kids' kids in the future. I, don't, I hate to see 21 most polluted cities in the world. Um, and I think people talk about pollution, but they don't do anything. Um, you know, uh, and I think there are a lot of people now that are joining this journey that are going to make a change. Guys, I got to run. It's been a great pleasure. It's been an honor being on a panel with you guys. Um, it was great speaking to you all and hope to see you guys soon somewhere. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Samir, uh, Samir, uh, concluding remarks from you before you leave. You're on mute, uh, Samir. I'll just uh, spell out the stages once again. You know, if you want to become Nirbhar, Atma Nirbhar, we were thus far importing uh, most of the powertrain. I mean, I'll, I'll focus on the powertrain because that's what we do. Uh, most of that was being imported. Um, in the two years that have passed by, although we haven't scaled that much, uh, we have now um, collectively, not just our organization, as cracked about 30% or 40% of that, whatever we were importing, we are not importing anymore. So we've exceeded 50, 60% or close to that. I think what was said earlier that it will either be through completely re-innovated or redesigned in India, or more likely there'll be multiple joint ventures, there'll be multiple collaborations to bring technology as well as uh, manufacturing right into India, both the design as well as the manufacturing right into India. And over time, and I'm, I'm just saying that time is not five years away, that's between two to five years in that journey, because it takes a while to, to start, you know, manufacturing in India after designing. Between two to five years, you'll see a huge number of changes. The future is going to be looking very colorfully different from what it looks today from the point of view of the powertrain but we'll have very Indian solutions that we'll be able to export five years from now. Uh, why even five years? I would say even earlier. But I think if you want to really become Atma Nirbhar, we'll have to traverse this journey in an accelerated manner. Those are my closing statements. And I, it was my pleasure to be here with all of you speaking about the future of electrification. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining in Mr. Sami today. Uh, so Thank before you. I take the Q and I'll come to uh, uh, I'll come to Mr. Harjab uh, with his concluding uh, remarks as well as one question from my side. Uh, 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 you know, with uh, with non-legacy technology or or uh, 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 otherwise, you know, players who have not been legacy automotive makers or, or being part of the uh, automotive community, uh, if you can say that. Uh, so. Uh, as as uh, as a third party consultant, so what what were the main uh, challenges that you had to address for them, and and you know and were they mostly towards electrification and its its increasing uh, acceptance, or were they also towards increasing the efficiencies of existing technologies with regards to uh, ICE or, or internal combustion engines? So I think both the things are uh, interlinked. The efficiency has to be also improved. And uh, whatever the deficiencies are there, that need to be also taken for the success of the product. So both the things are uh, very important. And uh, like uh, for increasing the efficiency earlier, uh, the initial uh, electric vehicles were quite heavy. So battery like batteries are also improving complete power train motor every year the friction reduction and these things are already taken care of by the like, complete supply chain and the developers and in, in addition the weight reduction is also one of the area which can be taken care of and the industry is working on that so a lot of scope is there 
for the weight reduction, for the battery weight reduction. So it can uh, definitely increase the range of the vehicle operation and the efficiency of the compute the entire uh, power train. Right. So do you think, do you think that uh, the upcoming regulation, uh, you know, the fuel efficiency regulations and, and be the cafe regulation, uh, do you think uh, they will require, uh, I'm talking about the passenger vehicle uh, market or the light vehicle market. So uh, do you think that those regulations will, will require OEMs to have pure electric vehicles in their portfolio or can they do without electric vehicles? You know, can they comply with the regulations without electric vehicles just by increasing their uh, increasing the efficiency of a base ICE or adding some degree of electrification Say mild hybrids or full hybrids, etc. Or, or do you think electrification or pure EVs will be necessary? What is your view? Like, if you see the global trend in this case, like for meeting the like cafe norms or the global like, like fleet uh, CO2 level, already the technology is in a saturation level. In case, if you see in case of uh, IC, and with the like in case of DPF, uh, like for the diesel, and in case of gasoline, also now with GDI, this. Uh, a particular filter is there because of the back pressure there is some uh, penalty to the power train plus the regeneration also there is a penalty to the power train so you need to go for some hybrid or electric vehicles in your fleet to meet the norms of the co2 yeah thank you so this is the so basic we'll need. Move... yeah this yeah. is the need of the hour you have to do okay okay yeah thank you so uh, we will move to the q and A. I I think we have roughly around 10 minutes and we have uh, the two, gen two of you gentlemen to answer those questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start off uh, with the first question then. So yeah, so the first question I have is about uh, uh, the sustainability of EV market given the geopolitics on uh, the source of lithium. So th this is the question like, uh, because the source of lithium is, maybe unstable politically, economically, or maybe some other reasons. So I think that is the question to be more elaborate. Yeah. So what do you think uh, will EV sustain in such an unstable uh, sourcing scenario with regards to lithium? Mr. Gupta, you can start. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Suraj. Uh, <clears throat> I think lithium at least is one of those uh, uh, natural resources, which is not controlled by the Chinese, thankfully, uh, unlike rare earths uh, and some of the others. So um, clearly lithium is available in uh, many, many parts of the world. South America clearly has a concentration, uh, while China has uh, made inroads into those uh, sourcing uh, uh, contracts. So has India. At, at a governmental level, uh, I think India has, has tied up lithium sources. Um, <clears throat> so while geopolitics may be there, but at the end of the day, you know, it's economics that works. Uh, so that will certainly uh, play out reasonably well. I think the bigger challenge on lithium is simply that demand is more than supply at this point of time. And so we are seeing a short term spike in uh, lithium ion cells. Uh, how long this short term lasts, we don't know, but maybe another six months, year, year and a half, uh, lithium ion cell prices will remain elevated until not just uh, lithium mines uh, 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 throw out more lithium, but also the <coughs> excuse me, the uh, cell factories come online, which are already under establishment. Also, in the medium to long term, we are going to see new technologies, whether it is aluminium, air, whether it is sodium based uh, uh, cells, and so on, uh, which over a five to 10 year period are definitely going to reduce the importance of lithium in the entire EV ecosystem. So I, I don't have a, a long-term or medium-term worry on, on supply of lithium. Short-term, we are already seeing the impacts. Right, I, I hope that answers the question to, uh, to the uh, gentleman from the audience. So the next question, Mr. Ajat, is, is about uh, the evolution of uh, the charging times of, of EV batteries. So the, the, the gentleman thinks that that is going to be the make or break point, you know, the zero to 80% uh, charging time. So how do you see that 
uh, evolving in, in the next few years. What, what will be the expected you know, time duration of uh, reaching zero to 80 for, for say a passenger vehicle for a uh, two wheeler and a three wheeler? Definitely, this will be one of the very important points for the charging. Like, and this depends upon the technology that the, the type of charger which is being used. And other thing is that the time available uh, by the user. If overnight charging is there, that is good for the life of the battery. But uh, during the day run, the, the range of the vehicle is less, and he need to charge, and he need to go for, further for his uh, like uh, wherever the person has to use the vehicle. So at that time, the fast charging will be required. But yeah, and these technologies are available. Battery side also, this is improving. Charging side also, this is improving. Both the technologies are now available. So some balance has to be made within the this. But overall, if you see. The uh, battery life is depending on the number of charge cycles. So yeah. this, is, this area has to be also seen. Slow charging is uh, definitely better for the vehicle. So this has to be open question. Right, right. Uh, yeah, thank you. So the next question, the next question we have is uh, on, on the, um, uh, on the penetration rates of uh, electric vehicle passengers uh, cars uh, market in India, so maybe I can I can start off uh, answering that question and come to uh, Mr. Gupta and Mr. Hajar. Uh, uh, also, I'd like to showcase the capabilities that we have as an organization, uh, SNP Global. So we do have uh, four cars available to, till uh, you know for the next 12 years. So according to our assessment, we think that the Indian passenger vehicle market. Uh, as the base case with all the parameters that we have and the visibility we have, uh, we foresee the passenger vehicle market to reach around uh, eight, eight and a half percent uh, pure electrics by 2030, that is the base case. But we also have uh, some alternative scenarios which build on this and which are more positive than these. So yeah, so if, if you want to know more details about it, please do get in touch with me. Or, or, Mr. or Mr. Dipanshu later after this conference. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, what are your views? You know, uh, just just numbers. What do you think? Ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent. Short answer. So I, you know, honestly, we uh, you know at Alter Green, we don't have a view on the passenger vehicle market, the yeah. passenger car market. Uh, personally, I may have certain views, but uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Sohi being in touch with OEMs and. and may have a better picture on what are their plans. In this case, I think the overall the cost, cost and the range are linked. Uh, the day the cost are a little bit uh, comfortable for the customer so that the ROI is there by the car buyer will be one of the good. But uh, there are segment of people in the market who want to be green. So that market will always be there. And people are crazy to go for electric vehicle. And with the good, good financing schemes and uh, the, if the leasing for the battery will be there so that the cost can be reduced. So I think this can uh, attract a lot of uh, passengers that in the uh, industry. Is working yeah, on that. I think Mr. Soy made a good point about, uh, about cost of the vehicle. So Suraj, you might have a view on when, when the cost of a passenger car, let's say, uh, uh, you know, Eight to ten lakh rupee ice car. When will a comparable EV reach that price point? At at what battery price will will a EV reach that price point? You're on mute. Yeah, that's that's a very important input that goes into our model in in making these projections. You know the uh, the projected cost of electric vehicles and what will be the comparable of uh, price of a uh, similarly uh, specced ICE vehicle. So uh, we think that the, uh, the price of batteries, you know, at a cell level, at a pack level, will we'll, uh, factor in, will come in and play a major role. Uh, so parity, we think that parity in terms of price, range, and convenience are going to play key. Uh, users, uh, especially personal drivers, you know, personal car users, they do not want to change the way they drive cars or use the cars in terms of waiting for refilling your car or 
or or you know uh, having to take care of it during rainy season or doing a very hot summer day so you don't want to change too much the way you use your product so all those uh, factors do come in and a parity has to uh, uh, you know has to be reached so we do not think that parity will be achieved by 2030 so that, that is the only thing i can say right now but again yeah uh, you can reach out to me uh, again for so, for more details if you want i'll move to the next question without digressing too much yeah so uh, next question is around uh, uh, safety issues i think it's it's a very uh, very important question and and it's pertinent that uh, we address it we as an industry uh, as an industry address it so how how do you see the uh, uh, you know acceptance of evs in in the coming in, in the short term you know because with the recent incidents of fires some fatal incidents at that it was sad but but we someone has to address it like we have to address it and and then fix it what do you think you're absolutely right i mean uh, <clears throat> this is this is very important safety is is absolutely paramount uh, and i think this safety comes from from two sides one is from the designer and the manufacturer or for want of a you know for for a, for a, a, a comprehensive word for it's it, it's dependent on the oem you know do you design it right do you engineer it right do you manufacture it right do you use the right materials do you not take shortcuts do you test it enough to make sure and test it enough in different conditions uh, and mr soi you know at uh, with his consulting background and his connections with icat and others clearly he's he's fully aware of this you know uh we just need to put in a lot more effort into all of these parameters and this is where i'm sorry for bringing altigreen into the picture but you know we we took a view very clear very early on that we have to design for for this country you can't import a technology which is designed for japan or or europe or us or china because the temperatures the conditions are very different and so therefore the component if it is brought to india as it is will not perform well fires is is one part of it it's the is the is the most worrisome and the most depressing part of uh, these problems but there are other problems as well so safety has to be addressed by the oems first and it has to be enforced by the by the regulators by the various uh, certifying agencies by government rules regulations policies uh, the enforcement must take place uh, there has to be uh, you know again i'm not a fan of policing but in this case there is a need for policing for what you would call conformance of production tests and so on more frequent conformance of production tests uh, i mean ice vehicles are 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 uh, reasonably safe given 120 years of development so uh, electric vehicles also need to uh, uh, do that full detailed engineering but at the same time i think we also have to keep in mind certain statistics and if you look at the statistics you find that even today after 120 years of development of ice vehicles on a per million kilometers run basis i'm talking worldwide you know i'm not talking about india or or japan or us and when i say worldwide you know the largest markets are the developed markets worldwide the number of accidents per million kilometers run is at least 10 times higher in the case of ice vehicles compared to electric vehicles. but that's just a statistic i think every accident is an accident too many uh, we have to put in all the efforts that we can to ensure that uh, these fires do, do not take place which means proper designing proper testing proper manufacturing yeah, very right uh, shilinder this will be very important like uh, during the development you need to go from from the entire development and validation team no shortcuts to this yeah, it no takes shortcuts. time it takes time when, the time has to be put in that money has to be put in when mpfa came uh, to india in 1995 around 1995 was the period a lot of fire accident was there then uh, cng also similar was there a lot of learnings are there similarly i think then this collectivity ev vehicle also a lot of incidents happened has already happened and uh, it should be taken taken very seriously i think this will be overcome very soon but because battery material is changing dms system is there which is taking care of the complete uh, system and battery management plus uh, lfe battery is also coming 
these are also one of the contribution to safeguard the fires i think thank you very much all right right um i think uh, with that we come to the close of this session and i thank you thank you very much uh, for answering the questions uh, so kindly and and uh, the whole session i believe have been has been very very informative and i believe the audience also found it uh, informative as well